In this video, I'm going to be walking you through my approach to antibiotics and how you go from the learning and how the knowledge that you have from the classroom into actual clinical practice. I'm going to be going over some resources that you can use as well as antibiotic grams that I have found helpful as well. For more educational resources like our HP notebooks, check out medicalbasics.com. So the first thing is the actual approach. And the reason why I'm going over approach to begin with is because initially when I was first starting off, after you study for step one, you kind of only have thought about antibiotics in a very specific way, or even just in classroom in general, no matter what field of study you're in, you think about antibiotics very simply. It's you think about antibiotics, you think about pathogens, and you think about diseases, but you're never able to integrate them all together. And I think it's because you don't have, a, I, did, I didn't personally have a good framework for this. And so this is kind of how I think about uh, these different antibiotics and, and, and coming up with a, a drug regimen. So the first thing is you have to think about the disease, right? When you're given a patient, you're given a patient who doesn't have a specific disease, doesn't have a specific pathogen that you're thinking about. You have a different set of symptoms. So you have a disease, you have to think about what type of presentation are they dealing with? Are you dealing with a pneumonia? Are you dealing with a UTI? And then after that, once you have a specific disease set, you have to think about what causes them. And from there, you're going to go into, well, now that you have a, a set of pathogens that cause, let's say, pneumonia, now you have to think about what will cover them. And these are very different. So, for example, when you're dealing with a disease, I'll show you a resource that you can utilize to make this very helpful, or very easy for you to kind of look up what are the common pathogens that you're dealing with and then what are the common um, antibiotics that will cover them. But what you're always given initially in, in med school is you're given these antibiotic grams. You're, you're given these antibiotics and you're told to just memorize them. But kind of going through this, it only covers this second part. It only covers the pathogen and what covers them. It's a good way to memorize just to kind of learn for a test, but not a great way to actually learn for clinical practice. I found that this antibiotic gram was more difficult for me to kind of understand. This, this one right here is one that I use quite e effectively. I think that they're very helpful once you're actually given, let's say you, you've sent out blood cultures and now you have a pathogen that you're dealing with and you want to kind of think of what drug regimen. These antibiotic grams are very helpful. Also, when you're getting pimped, these are going to be very helpful. So they're, they're useful in a variety of ways and I'll kind of walk through them each. So this one um, essentially is broken down by quadrants. So it's kind of confusing at first, but once I describe it, it'll be easier. So up here is atypical, gram-positive, MRSA, anaerobes, gram-negative, pseudomonas, as well as parasites. So based off what's shaded, it'll be what's covered. So we'll take doxycycline, for example. It's going to have atypical coverage. It's going to have gram-positive because that's that top left, as well as MRSA coverage. Now we're going to look at another example. Let's say we're going to take Cipro. It's going to have gram-positive coverage as well as pseudomonas coverage. So this is kind of one way, one easy way you can kind of think of what is the best resource that you can find uh, online and kind of just stick with that uh, once you're dealt with a pathogen. But initially when you're dealing with the disease, what is a good resource for that? So there's a lot of resources out there that can be useful for thinking about diseases. One, one of the ones that I found to be most helpful was Infectious Disease Management Program at UCSF, and they had made all these different guidelines for empiric therapy, uh, both for inpatient, outpatients, as well as pediatrics. And I'll, I'll walk you through with a few examples of how I use this. There's a number of resources that you can use. This is the one that I found to be most helpful. One thing I do want to emphasize is that depending on the institution that you train at, um, they may have their own resources and also the antibiotics that are going to be used to treat a specific pathogen at one institution is not necessarily going to be the same antibiotic that you can use at another institution just based off of actual coverage, um, based off of what uh, the resistance pattern of the, that community that you're dealing with. So let's take this one for example. Let's say we're dealing with an outpatient that we have a suspected pneumonia. So they've kind of broken it down um, into outpatients. They have all these different um, categories of disease. Let's say this is a community-acquired pneumonia. So when we're actually dealing with community-acquired pneumonia, it kind of breaks it down by the different pathogens. So we have uh, our diagnosis, uh, which is community-acquired pneumonia. We have all the different pathogens that can cause this. So it's a good way to just, or it's a good thing to just write all of these down. So if they ask you on rounds and you say, well, actually, these are the com most common causes of community-acquired pneumonia in the outpatient setting. And these are the first-line drugs of choice. So we have doxycycline, we have zithro. Um, if they're on some type of other antibiotic therapy um, or have other type of comorbidities, we'd start thinking about levothyroxine or amoxifoxacin and also amoxicillin plus doxycycline or azithromycin. And so they have all these different um, 
treatments for uh, community acquired pneumonia. And also they have the actual dosing. And I think this is extremely important because especially early on, you're just going to say, oh, let's treat them with, with doxycycline. But you're not going to know the dosing. You're not going to know the duration. You're not going to know how frequently. So I think this is really important because it gives you that one up. It shows that you uh, have actually thought about it and think of the next steps for it. So doxycycline, 100 milligrams BIDs for duration of seven days has all these different things as well. The other thing that I want to talk about is the actual, all these different hyperlinks. So some of them are hyperlinks, some of them are not. And let's say doxycycline, for example, what they've kind of broken it down for is there's all these different antibiotics. And if they have some sort of restriction, for example, we need to renal adjust them or renal dose them, they'll kind of break it down. Somebody who has a creatinine clearance of greater than 50, uh, someone who has 10 to 50 and, and less than 10. And, and if you just scroll down all the way down to the bottom, find the antibiotic that you're dealing with, you can kind of figure out what uh, type of renal adjustment that you'll need based off the different antibiotic. Uh, so I think that that's extremely important because it gives you also another advantage um, showing that you kind of thought about these things beforehand. So that's pneumonia in an outpatient setting. Let's now deal with uh, pneumonia in an inpatient setting and we'll see how that differs. So respiratory tract infection, let's say this is also community acquired pneumonia. So when we're now thinking about community-acquired pneumonia in a inpatient, we start thinking about a few other things, right? We still have the strep pneumonia, we have all these atypicals, uh, but we also have, now we start thinking about um, some type of gram-negative org organisms. Um, so based off of that, our treatment is going to be a little bit different. So now we start thinking about ceftriaxone plus doxycycline, because remember doxycycline covers atypicals, and then ceftriaxone is now going to be more heavy-duty drug. It's going to be IV. It's also going to cover our gram-negative organisms. And we also think about things like levo or moxifloxacin again. And so we can kind of just browse through and look at them. It's a good way to just think about different organisms or think about different diseases and see how do they differ um, based off the different presentation. So now that we've actually talked about pneumonia in, in the perspective of the disease and think about the causes and the treatment, I want to kind of summarize them to think about why we're actually using each of these individual treatments. So the empiric guidelines for, from UCSF is a great way to just ha have that in your back pocket, but you have to also kind of think about it and, and conceptually reason out why these are, are used. So common causes of pneumonia, remember strep pneumo, uh, our mycoplasma, chlamydia, legionella, these are our atypicals, H flu, some gram negative rods like Klebsiella, anaerobes, and obviously viruses are going to be probably our most common, uh, but we're actually specifically talking about antibiotics here. So when we're dealing with outpatients, we're really dealing with these guys up here. Uh, we're dealing with all of the gram positives as well as the uh, atypicals. And then when we're starting to work into inpatients, we're going to include all of these guys down here. And viruses are going to be both. So let's think about it. Why, why is doxycycline a good drug regimen specifically for outpatients? Well, let's look at doxycycline in our antibiotic gram. So we see that it has atypical coverage. Um, it has gram positive and also MRSA coverage. So gram positive, as well as all these atypical, is a perfect outpatient regimen. Same thing with azithromycin. It's going to cover all of our atypical organisms. Now let's head over to levofloxacin and moxifloxacin. Why, why is this a good regimen? So uh, levofloxacin and moxifloxacin, they have atypical coverage as well as uh, gram-negative coverage. So once we start worrying about our gram-negative organisms, this is now when we're going to start thinking about using moxifloxacin or levofloxacin. And then in our very severely ill patients that are in patients that are having ceftriaxone as well as doxycycline, why is that the case? Well, ceftriaxone, let's try to find it here, is, is gram-negative coverage, right? It has very, very good gram-negative coverage, but it doesn't really have much of anything else or not very good coverage of, of the atypicals. Um, actually has no coverage of the atypicals. So that's why we're going to add doxycycline on top of it. It's going to have atypical coverage and much better gram-positive as well as MRSA coverage. So that's kind of how we actually approach choosing these, these drugs and kind of thinking about them. So the next example that I want to walk through is some type of UTI. Let's say we're dealing with a 
Uh, a woman that's coming in who has UTI, we think it might be cystitis. So we're going to go down to our urinary tract infections. And then we're going to look at cystitis. And, and right now I have it as an outpatient. You can also look at it as an inpatient as well. But I'm just going to show uh, for simplicity's sake of an outpatient. So what are we dealing with? What type of pathogens are we dealing with? Cystitis. We're going to be dealing with E. coli, Staph saprophyticus. They're going to be our most common. And we're going to have all these variety of, of first-line choices. We're going to have uh, nitroferentoin, Bactrim, phosphomycin, and we're going to have other um, alternative drugs as well as Cipro and Levofoxacin. And they've kind of broken it down to recurrent cystitis, asymptomatic bacteria. Uh, remember, no treatment is required uh, for asymptomatic bacteria. Um, and the exceptions are as follows. Pregnant women, patients with traumatic uh, urologic procedures. So that was something that I was always commonly pimped on. So I just wanted to um, kind of touch on that. So similar to pneumonia, we're going to be talking, kind of breaking it down for UTI. So most common causes, uh, specifically for an outpatient, is going to be E. coli um, and Staph saprophyticus. So, so these are, are common causes. E. coli is by far going to be much more common. And then the different antibiotics. So nitroferentoin, suffice it to say, it's not in the actual diagram, but it has very good gram-native coverage. We're going to look at Bactrim which is going to be right over here. So it has the reason why we're using it is because it has good gram-native coverage. It also has um, MRSA gram-positive coverage as well. So it would be good to kind of cover our staph saprophyticus for our gram-positive. Cipro or Levo uh, is really just for gram-negative. So it depends on what we're actually thinking is going to be the cause. Um, and when we're dealing with the impatience, then we're going to start thinking about ceftriaxone or penem um, and piptazo. So this kind of gives us a good framework Primarily when you're dealing with UTI, you're going to be worried about E. coli. That's going to be the most common cause. Uh, that's kind of why we're dealing with a lot of uh, treatments that are specifically dealing with uh, gram negatives. And the last example that I want to walk us through is going to be something like cellulitis. Let's say we have a skin and soft tissue infection. Uh, we're dealing with cellulitis. And remember, there's other types of skin and soft tissue infections. So they've kind of broken it down for us. And let's say this is an outpatient. So let's do cellulitis. And we're going to be dealing in an outpatient setting. So most commonly, we're going to be dealing with our beta hemolytic uh, strep, also staph aureus, is going to be another uh, common but less common organism. So the common causes for this is going to be cephalexin, amoxicillin and clinomycin. Those are going to be our most common treatments um, and they have all the doses there. So similarly, we're going to be looking at cellulitis and kind of breaking it down. Most common causes are going to be our beta hemolytic strep as well as staph aureus. The beta hemolytic strep is going to be strep pyogenes and agalactia and all these are going to be our gram positive. When we're dealing with cellulitis, we're going to be thinking about gram positive. So our antibiotics that we're going to be choosing are going to be gram positive as well. So the first one is going to be uh, cephalexin. More commonly, you're going to be thinking about it as Keflex, right? That's what we're thinking of when you when you hear Keflex. It's a very common treatment for cellulitis, and we're going to see why that's the case. So uh, Keflex, um, really, it's it's gram positive coverage. That's that's why we're using it. It also has gram negative coverage as well. But really, the benefit that we're going to be seeing for cellulitis is going to be the gram positive. Same thing with the amoxicillin is going to be gram positive as well. Clindamycin, we're going to see that it has gram-positive coverage, but it also has MRSA coverage. So if we're starting to think more about, well, now we need a, a, a regimen for uh, a cellulitis that we're also suspecting of MRSA, we're going to be dealing with that. And it also has anaerobic coverage as well, but really what we're, we're dealing with is up here. So the gram-positive as well as the MRSA. So I think that for this, just in general, kind of the way I approach it is, is I always look up on the empiric therapy, thinking about what are common pathogens and also what are common treatments for these for these different diseases and i think that's a really good way to approach it but you always have to kind of conceptualize and think about why we're choosing those medications rather than just blankly looking up an empiric therapy be sure to check out our website medicalbasics.com for more educational resources like our medical id cards and don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more tips and lessons